Well, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to week four of Baking with Ancient Grains. And I'm Denise Smith. I'm the um, Nutrition and Food Safety Educator in Niobrara County in Wyoming. And um, I'm the baker today, and we're also being joined by Caitlin Youngquist. She is the Ag um, extension educator up in Warland or Washakie County. And she is the person that knows all about growing um, our ancient grains. And so she's going to visit with us about that. She's also um, been doing a lot of experimenting with sourdough using ancient grains. So um, Erin has been picking her brain a little bit about um, using sourdough. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Caitlin for a few minutes and she's going to visit on the agriculture side of ancient grains. Well, thank you, Denise. I appreciate the invitation and I've been really enjoying watching you go through these different recipes and I've been learning a lot as well. I'm going to talk a little bit today about another use for these grains, which is cooking them as whole grains. And it can sometimes be confusing to folks um, what, how to use some of these different grains. And so, as I mentioned earlier, we're talking about spelt, emmer, and einkorn, which are some of the ancestors of our modern wheat. And this is what they look like when they come out of the field. There's a, there, the einkorn there is the smallest and the oldest variety or the oldest ancestor of, the, of the, our modern wheat. And then emmer and spelt. And they actually come out of the grain with their holes still on them. So they have to go through another processing phase to become a, a grain that can be used for cooking and for flour. And one way that these grains are used often is a, is a dish called farro, which is actually an Italian uh, word and it's a common Italian dish. And it's when the grains are cooked whole. And so um, you may see uh, some of these terms used in different recipes. And you, may, and you can buy some of these grains labeled as farro. And you might see them as uh, farro piccolo or medio or grande, meaning small, medium, or large sized. The einkorn being the smallest, emmer uh, being sort of the, the medium size and the most commonly labeled as farro, and then spelt being a little larger. And I've experimented with these a little bit at home and I found that I really like the flavor of the emmer when it's cooked as a whole grain and the einkorn as well, both lend themselves to cooking as a whole grain and you can prepare them savory or sweet. And the other thing that's really great about these is you can cook them overnight in a, in a crock pot, you can cook them on the stove like rice and then they freeze really, really well at that point after they're cooked, which means they can be taken out of the freezer and used very quickly um, in, a, in a salad or in a hot dish or in a, um, in a breakfast dish. And these are some of the examples of some of the different types of dishes you can make with these farro grains. And I would highly encourage folks to try it. They're very simple to cook. Like I said, they can be cooked overnight. They can be cooked um, and frozen and or stored uh, and eaten a variety of ways. And they're very nutritious and they have different flavors. So I would encourage folks to try that a little bit. And then the other question that we've been getting recently, of course, is where can I buy these grains? We're talking about all these grains and yet we don't have a place to sell them yet. So the Wyoming First Grains Project does not have them available for retail sale yet. If you are coming through Warland, I have some grain that I will gladly share with you. Stop by the extension office and I'll send you home with a little bit of grain or flour to try. There's a new company in Powell called Wyoming Heritage Grains. They have some grain for sale. They have a few, I think they have some emmer. They're also working with the Heritage Wheats 
not the ancient grains, but the heritage wheats that are um, some older varieties that also have some really unique flavor and nutritional profiles. And you can find them on Facebook. She's very, the woman who owns that business is very active at the farmer's market and on Facebook and they're based in Powell. And then Wheat Montana has some spelt and maybe a few other products. You can buy those online. And another regional company out of Montana, Timeless Natural Foods, they sell um, some of the farro as well. So those are some ideas of where you can look. And of course, just looking online or looking at your local natural food store may have some of the um, einkorn or the spelt or the emery either in grain or in flour. So hopefully that gives you some ideas of things to, to try. And I look forward to hearing um, what Denise tells us today about making bread. So thank you. Well, thanks, Caitlin, and we will see you next week for our last um, session of Baking with Ancient Grains, and um, we appreciate you spending your time and helping us all learn more about ancient grains. Well, thank you. I very much enjoyed it. So we'll see you next week. See you next week. Okay. And today we are going to make, um, it's called No Need Whole Wheat Bread. And this bread is super simple to make. If you've never made homemade bread, um, this is one you want to start with because it's pretty no fail and um, doesn't take much time to put together. It's a little different consistency. Um, if you're used to baking homemade bread, this is a more rustic, um, heavier bread than um, a bread that you would need a lot. So you just need to know, I think this one really goes well if you're doing soups or stews or with a salad. Um, I love it toasted because with the whole wheat in it or today we're going to be making it with spelt. Um, it's a real kind of a nutty flavor when it's toasted. It's really, really good. So with that, we'll get started. And um, so I've already measured out my milk and it takes a cup and a quarter of just regular milk. And we're using low fat milk, 1%. And I've heated it to between 100 and 110 degrees. You don't want it any more than that because any higher than that, it would kill our yeast. So we're first gonna combine um, our lukewarm milk. And if you don't have a thermometer at home, it's kind of like testing a baby bottle, just um, drop a little drop on your wrist. It should be warm, but not overly hot. And then we are going to combine a quarter cup of just regular apple juice and three tablespoons of our sugar, of our honey. And the honey and the apple juice are providing the, the sweetener for um, our bread today. Most times in a bread recipe, you have, you have um, some sort of sweetener to feed the yeast. And our honey's just a little thick today. And today we are using some of our honey that we um, not really grow here at the fairgrounds, but uh, we have beehives here at our fairgrounds. And um, so we do produce honey. And um, so this is some of our locally grown honey. And Kelly has checked on our bees last week when the weather was really, really nice. and. They're wintering very well, and it'll soon be warm enough, we hope, that they can come out of their hives a little. Friday's supposed to be 70, so they should be out and about. Um, yesterday, we had another little snowstorm go through here, that, and our weather has turned very, very cold again. So we're all looking forward to spring, but this will be a great time in this cold days ahead to make this bread and have um, some homemade soup and homemade bread. So the first thing we're going to do is just whisk this together a little and kind of break up the honey. And I also like this recipe is um, you don't 
have a ton of dirty dishes to wash. And anymore, I don't enjoy doing dishes that much, so. Okay, so we've kind of got it whisked together really well. Okay, and now we're just gonna add the remaining ingredients, which is a teaspoon of just regular salt. And I did not bring an extra bowl to make it, so we'll try to. And we always need salt in a yeast recipe. Salt kind of controls how much your yeast grows. If you don't have any control mechanism, your yeast will grow and grow and grow and grow until it can't support itself anymore and it collapses. So you do need something to kind of control that. We also need a one package of yeast and we buy our yeast in bulk because we do a lot of baking with it. So if you have a bulk package of yeast, um, two and a quarter teaspoons of your yeast equals one little package. So we will put two and a quarter in teaspoons in. And we're gonna put two cups of our spelt flour. And we have baked this bread numerous times. We've made it with whole wheat, we've made it with spelt, we've made it with emmer. And what we found is that the whole wheat and spelt work really well. As we talked about last time, the emmer is not quite as strong to like do breads that need to rise. And so what we found is when we've done it with emmer, it rises really well, but it is not strong enough to support um, that structure in the bread. And so it fell and we had a big hole in the middle of our loaf and it tasted really good, but it just did not um, hold up to the bread as well as it should have. So today, that's why we're doing the spell for our ancient grain. And this is a really pretty um, kind of light tan flour. So it, it makes your bread have a really pretty color. So then in addition to our two cups of spelt flour, we're going to put in a cup and a quarter of just all purpose flour. And this does help your bread to rise as well, a mixture of the two flours. I think you could easily um, do all spelt. It may just not rise as, as high as with our other flour mixed in. Cup and a quarter of this. This makes a pretty large loaf of bread. So if you have kind of an, a, an oversized loaf pan, um, I would use that. And all we do is mix this up and it's gonna be kind of a stiff, kind of rough looking dough. And I don't know if you can see what it looks like, Erin. But it is not real smooth and you're not gonna do any kneading. It's a lot wetter than what you think of traditional mm -hmm. bread dough. Yes. Cause you could not knead this. Uh, no. So all we're going to do at this point is lightly spray our um, loaf pan with some cooking spray. We're going to kind of, and it literally does kind of plop into your pan. And we 
we will let this rise about 45 to 70 minutes, um, depending on how warm your room is. And last time that we made this, um, it did take the whole 75 minutes and a little longer because our room here at the fairgrounds is not overly warm. It's it's comfortable, but Brad likes it warm, warm. So you just kind of get it so it's nice and level in your bread pan. And what are we looking for when it rises? Like how long are um, like, it our doubles judgment? in size? So um, this is probably about an inch thick. So um, probably not quite to the top of our loaf pan will be double in size. You do want to cover it up to um, keep it from drying out. And it also will hold any heat in there that there is. So with that, um, we will check it at it's now quarter to two. We'll check it about 2.30, see if it's risen enough. If not, we'll let it rise a little longer. And then we will post a picture of this on the, um, Facebook, on the page. Facebook page so you can see what it looks like. But just do remember, it's gonna be real lumpy on the top. It's not gonna have that real smooth um, top like your kneaded breads do and it'll be just more of a rustic country loaf. So the other thing I thought I would talk about today is oftentimes people don't really understand what we're talking about when we talk about um, whole grains and whole grain flour. And this is a picture of a um, kernel of wheat. So basically it's the same concept whether we're talking about our modern day wheat or um, our spelt or emmer or einkorn. Um, you have one kernel and on it, the brown part here is the bran, which is the covering of that whole kernel. And in the bran, um, that's where we find the fiber, the minerals and most of the B vitamins. Then we have the white part here, which is the endosperm. And that has some protein and some carbohydrates. And then this little part down here is the germ, which also has lots of B vitamins, antioxidants, fats, vitamin E's, and phytonutrients. So when we're talking about whole wheat or whole grain flour, when it goes through the flour mill, they grind up the entire kernel. So you get all the nutrients in every part of that kernel. And that's why we consider whole wheat to be much more healthy than white flour. And you get a lot of extra fiber because this bran part has more fiber in it. But when we have just all purpose flour, they strip away the bran and they strip away the germ. And the only part of the wheat kernel that they grind is the endosperm. So you're missing out on all the nutrients that are in the other parts of that kernel, plus a lot of fiber. So that's why we encourage people to use whole grains, whole grain um, flours, rather than strictly all purpose flour. And a lot of people are very confused about how do we get white flour out of um, wheat and how do we get whole wheat? So, that's just a really quick and easy um, explanation of, of the difference of the flowers. So next week, we will be um, making um, scones. scones, some spelt scones. And um, I used to be a terrible scone maker, but we found a really good recipe and it, it's worked very well. And so it's kind of a fun and different way to um, make a biscuit-like product. So with that, we're going to sign off. Again, if anybody has any questions, I got a really interesting question yesterday from a lady who watched our video last week. So um, please do contact either myself or Caitlin. 
L or Carrie Everly at CEREC, and we'll be sure to get back with you to um, answer those questions. So with that, we'll hope everybody has a great week and everybody have a happy Easter and we'll see you next Tuesday.